going, Lexi? All right, y'all turn to Luke 4. Um, I know the chat is disabled. Roger just told me, but Lexi disabled it because she's having some trouble with some folks this morning, so that's why. <clears throat> All right, in Luke chapter 4, we're uh, covering the story where Christ goes back to the synagogue and he preaches. And it's in his own hometown, and of course he's not accepted. And really what goes on here is the people's motive comes out. And what I mean by that is preaching brings out the motive for why you're there. Um, if a person's there to learn God's Word and, and to, you know, to fellowship and that sort of thing, then no matter what the subject is, the preaching will be profitable. But if a person's there for an ulterior motive, and in these people's case, it was to see signs and wonders. When they don't see what they want, and in our case, lots of times when people don't hear what they want, then immediately they turn and they lash out. Now, these people turn and they lash out at Christ, of course, and it's a shame. Here he is preaching to them the year year of Jubilee. Now, for a Jew, this should have been the greatest thing. Look, the Jubilee pictured something. He, you had a period of time, okay, where Israel was looking for the Messiah, right? And they divided all time into two ages. They didn't have all these multiple ages like men claim today. They were looking for the kingdom age. And when Christ came, what came? The kingdom age. And so, from that point forward has been the Jubilee. Have slaves been set free for 2,000 years? Yes. Still being set free today, aren't they? You know, when you hear the preaching of the gospel and you sit under it, you never know if you're ever going to hear it again. A lost person never knows. I mean, y'all consider these people in Nazareth. They sit in there, they hear it, and we don't ever have a recorded instance of him ever preaching there again, do we? You know, the more someone hears the gospel and doesn't get saved, they become gospel hardened or they become um, so secure in their position because of their religion that they won't even consider they might be lost. When, when a person has someone uh, hears the gospel and it makes them wonder about their salvation, that's always a good thing. Even if the person's saved, self-examination, Paul said, is a good thing. I mean, isn't it better safe than sorry? And yet these people have the Jubilee preached to them, and what do they say? Nope. We're not only slaves, or not slaves, we're going to go on in the position we're in. Let's kill this man. And so they lead him out to the edge of the, the hill. They're going to throw him off the hill. The Jews had two ways of stoning people. Essentially, they would tie a person up and stone them with stones, throwing it at them. Or sometimes they would throw them off into the stones, and many times they would then stone them. They say that's what they did to James, the half-brother of the Lord. Threw him off the temple and killed him, and then stoned his dead body. That, that's what history says. But that's what they want to do to Christ. And Christ passed through the midst of them. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know what he did. Uh, he could have just, you know, you watch a movie and everybody goes in, they can't move. And he, well, I don't know. Maybe it was just a look. Maybe whatever it was, they didn't touch him. Now, why didn't they touch him? Wasn't it wasn't his time. Folks, this is, this is all very simple if we just let the Bible say what it says. He came to do a thing, and that thing was going to happen at exactly the time God the Father had planned and not a second before. So he comes here and he does this. Now, familiarity breeds contempt. You know, Christ had just told them in verse 18, Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now that's Isaiah quoting what the Messiah would say. And what does Christ say? This applies to me. So Christ is claiming to be the Son of God. Did they ever stop and consider whether this man was the Son of God? You know what their question is? Look in verse 22. In the end, is not this Joseph's son? Folks, they're trying to figure out, they're worried about his Joe's. Y'all you know, know what they're saying. Hey, this is the kid that worked in the carpenter shop, right? We know his old man built my fence or what, something like that. See, in other words, what they're saying here is, this man has no authority to make me feel inadequate about myself because this man is just as inadequate as, as me. In fact, he's more inadequate. He is the carpenter's son. Carpenter was not a high position. Okay? Uh, a, a better way to say it might be this. Who are you? What are you talking to me? I know you, you dropped out in the eighth grade. 
What are you talking to me for, right? That sort of thing. So when they're talking about Christ, they never consider the true thing that matters. Now, what did Christ say was the foundation upon which he would build his church? He said the church has a foundation, didn't it? And he said on that foundation, he would build his church. Okay? And then he tells us what the foundation is. The foundation is Christ. But he made specific to Peter what the foundation was. The profession of faith and the belief and the acknowledgement that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Now, that is the faith that matters. Faith in miracles doesn't mean anything. Folks, believing in miracles will not save you. Y'all go to John 11. You know, this sounds silly to say, but I'm going to use an example. Today you'll ask someone about their, their you know, relationship with God, and many times a person will tell you about how uh, they quit drugs or you know, about something that happened. They'll tell you about an experience. And basically what they're telling you about is some physical thing that happened, but belief in physical things is not faith. Faith starts with the person of Christ. And no true faith goes anywhere without that. Because without that, there is no true faith. It all starts with the person of Christ. Now watch in John 11 here. In John 11, verse uh, 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on Him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees of a council and said, What do we? This man doeth many miracles. Did they believe in the miracles? Are they saved? No. Folks, faith is not walking by sight. You know, it's a... It's a paradox of Christianity to say this, but we have to believe it to see it. Y'all know what we say in this world, I'll believe it when I see it, right? But in, in our case, we've got to believe first to see any of the fruits of, of Christian life. You don't, you don't prove Christian life by seeing it because you'll never see it unless you believe it. Right, we've got examples of this. Let's go look at a few. Go over to Matthew 15. Now, this is a highly misused passage, but let's go look at it. You know, there was a, a fellow, I think his name was uh, Bertrand Russell. Russell was his last name, I know, but he was a famous... Uh, atheist writer and he did. You ever heard of Bertrand Russell, Mr. Bailey? Uh -huh. And he wrote a lot of things and was real witty and, and you know smart and all this but one of the things he said, I, I wrote a, the quote down, I think it was from him, but he said when someone asked him if he was, when he died, if he was brought before God, what was he going to say? Because he said there was no God, right? He said, well that's very simple. I'll just say not enough evidence, God. In other words, I'll tell God that I couldn't believe because, God, it's your fault. You didn't give me enough evidence to believe. Now, isn't that how the world looks at things? Not enough evidence, God. That's exactly what the people in the synagogue are saying here with Christ. Not enough evidence. Where's the miracles, right? Now, watch what happens here. In Matthew 15, and this is amazing to me because this happens shortly after he leaves Nazareth where his own received him not. In verse 21, Jesus went thence, went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon is not part of Israel. It's in the north outside the boundary of Israel. Matter of fact, it was a great merchant, a set of merchant cities. It was a real famous ancient cities. It says, Behold, a woman of Canaan. What's that make this woman? A Gentile. People argue and fight over this. But this woman is a Gentile. She came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Wouldn't this Gentile just call Christ? Lord. Thou son of David. Folks, this woman knew something of the Jewish Messiah, didn't she? And she said, My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. She crieth after us. Jesus doesn't say anything to her. 
Now, real quick, we're going to have to deal with something. There are those that say Christ knew his, his ministry was not to this woman and therefore he can't talk to this woman, but the woman's so pers persuasive that he changes his mind. What's that say about the Lord? I don't know. That he either he didn't know or right. So whatever he's doing, he's not doing uh, on a change of mind. He's doing it for a purpose. He doesn't say anything to her for a reason. It says the disciples come and they don't say, "Why are you not helping her?" Did they say, "Get rid of us. She won't shut up. She's bothering us." He answered and said, "I am not sent, but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel." Right now. Who is the house of Israel in the mind of Christ? Is it every single Israelite? It's his sheep. And what do we find out? In John 10, he says, I've got sheep. He said, matter of fact, I've got a lot of sheep that are not of this fold. This is the Israel of God. Now, if Christ said, I didn't come but to the Jews, and it's against the law and wrong for me to speak to someone who's not a Jew, why is he going to help her? They say, well, he changed his mind or what like that. Well, what about the centurion? He helped him, didn't he? It's because what this woman represents is a true Israelite of God. She is, even though she's a Gentile by, by race. So it says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. All right, Jesus is preaching, and he calls the congregation dogs. What's going to be the result? What's the result in Nazareth when he calls them slaves? They want to kill him. He calls this woman a dog. Now, what did the Jews refer to the Gentiles as? Dogs. Folks, a dog was not a beloved house guest in, in Israel. It was an unclean, filthy animal, right? And that's what they called the Gentiles because they considered them unclean. And Jesus says to this woman, you are of the dogs. Now, watch what this woman says. She said, truth, Lord. Everybody hear that? What did she just say? You're right. You're right. Truth, Lord. She said, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Has she just called him her master? You see, this woman says, that's right. Dogs are unclean and they deserve nothing, and yet their master loves them so much he supplies even dogs. Y'all see what this woman's saying? You're right. I'm everything you're saying, and yet you, you're going to look out for me. You're going to take care of me. Now watch what he says. Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now there are people that say, yeah, but she wasn't saved. Does she have faith? Yes. How are we saved? By faith. By faith. Hey, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And this woman obviously had heard the Word of God because she calls Jesus the Son of David. And yet what nationality is she physically? A Gentile. She's a physical dog. And what did Christ tell her? She's one of His sheep. Right? It's the same thing Luke's showing us. Okay? Luke uses two Gentiles, a Gentile widow and a Gentile soldier. It's amazing. He takes one of the poorest people in the world for one example, and he takes one of the richest people in the world for the other. The, the soldier we're going to read in a minute wasn't just a regular soldier. He's the head of the Syrian army. Okay? Gentiles, every nationality outside of Israel. Everyone outside of the Jew, that's right. No it don't matter. It's every, it's, there's only two. There's the Jew, the people of God, and there's the nations. And all that pictured back here, God's people, everybody else, believers, unbelievers. That's all it amounts to. All right, now let's go look at these two he picked because there's something in this. Do you notice that this woman had faith in the person of Christ, didn't she? Right? Well, what was the requirement then? Before she saw any miracle, before anything was done for her, she believed in Him as who He was, didn't she? To go over to Matthew 8, we'll look one more. I want to show you all that the two examples He picked from the Old Testament are the, are the true of the same thing. Both of those people had to believe something before they received it. All right, in Matthew 8, 5. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion. Now, a centurion is a, is a soldier in the Roman army. This is not a Jew. 
There came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, notice the second time he's called him Lord. You know what all the Jews called him for the most part? Rabbi. Master, teacher, right? Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Does this man think the Jews are a great people? No, but he knows Christ is. He said, Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority. He said, Having soldiers under me, I say to this one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Now, what's the man saying about Christ? He's saying, you've got the authority I've got times a thousand, right? He said, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto him, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel, physical Israel. And as I say unto you, many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What's he referring to? Gentiles being saved. He said... I haven't found the kind of faith you have already professed. I haven't found that faith amongst my own people. He said, but no fret, the kingdom's going to be filled up with all kind of people. In other words, you're not one of my people physically by race, but you're one of my people. Now he says, Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. Now y'all go back to uh, 1 Kings 17. Let's go look at the example he uses from Luke. Where? First Kings 17. You know, that makes the difference of religion. Is, you know, people want to throw out God. They name God. Just God this, God that, I believe in God. But Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, person. Yep. It makes the difference. It is. It's all the difference. Yeah. You know, it's one of the reasons why you'll find a, a Christian, you go to write something or say something, and at times you don't even want to just say Jesus. You don't even want to just say Christ. We want to say the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're offended to hear someone throw His name around frivolously, aren't we? It's uh, true Christianity starts with foundation faith in the person of Christ. That's why he told Peter, when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said, That's the foundation, Peter. That's where it starts. Now, will just believing that he's the Christ save us? But how can you believe what he did for us if we don't believe who he is? So how does it all start? By believing who he is. But I got news for y'all. Anyone that truly believes who He is is going to go on and believe what He did for them. Because if you pronounce who He is in truth, who's already convicting you and working with you? The Spirit. Okay? Now, in 1 Kings 17, we've got this example. Now, this is during the days of uh, Elijah. Okay? Elijah was a great prophet when Israel had the, one of the worst kings he ever had, Ahab. Ahab married Jezebel. It wasn't enough that Ahab was ungodly. He went and got the ungodliest wife he could find, and who wore the pants? She did. You know, you find him, it's like a little sniveling brat one time when he can't buy a piece of property he wants, and so what does she do? She said, oh, shut up, I'll get it for you, and goes out and kills the guy and takes the property. I mean, this, this is what Israel was like in these days, right? Now, Elijah comes along, and there's a famine. And by the way, the famine, we're told in two other parts of Scripture, lasts three and a half years. Now, if you read in 1 Kings, you'll see at the end of three years it starts. But remember, they had six years between their two rainy months, so it was three and a half years. But I want you all to consider the picture. Jesus said right here, like it was in the days of Elijah, when there was three and a half years without rain, He said, but He healed a widow among the Gentiles. How long was Jesus Christ's earthly ministry? And for the most part, what was it? It was a famine among the Jews. Folks, I mean, y'all look at it. Thousands followed him. Thousands came to see and to listen and see the miracles. And yet, in, in Acts chapter 1, how many are we wound up with in the upper room? 120. You see how it would look like nothing happened. You know, that's why Isaiah said when he came, he is despised and rejected, right? 
So it looked like an absolute famine for three and a half years, didn't it? And yet what does he say? It's not. They're, they're those. And it's the same thing that caused people of, of dispensational persuasion to say that this ministry fell on its face. It didn't. It did exactly what he was designed, uh, you know, he designed it to do. Now let's read what happened during this time. Verse 8. This is the example he uses. And I want you all to notice what this woman, she had to believe something before she received it. Verse 8. The word of the Lord came unto him, Elijah saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath. Now this is outside the land, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Now this happens in the exact same place that we just read about that woman he called a dog. Don't you all see the parallel? And here's this woman up here, not part of the Israel of, you know, of the Scriptures. And it says, Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain me. Can you all imagine what this must have been to Elijah? He's going to go depend on who? An unclean dog. And it says, He arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the wo a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. He called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. She said, I'm picking up sticks for a fire for the last meal me and my son are ever going to have. It's a famine, and they're about to starve to death. Right? It says in verse 13, Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Notice she said, The Lord thy God. Y'all notice Lord's all capitalized? That's the name of God. She said, Jehovah your God. So does this woman know about his God? Yeah. All right, verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, He's going to tell her what God said. Now, how does faith come? By hearing. By hearing. Here it comes. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Now here he tells this woman, who has just enough food for one more meal, she's ready to die, and he tells her, you're not going to die, the Lord's going to supply your need. Now, what's the woman's two choices? To believe. to believe or not to believe. What if she says, I believe, but I can't waste my last cake on you? Then she, doesn't really believe. she doesn't really believe. So what here happens? Her faith is then immediately put to the test, isn't it? It says, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. The barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. You know, there's another passage similar to this, but this woman goes to her barrel. Every day she reaches down in her barrel, and what does she find? The meal. The meal. She finds flour down there. You know, notice how the Lord did it. Did the Lord say, if you'll just give him this one meal, God said, if you'll give me this, I'll give you tenfold. Did he give her 50 barrels? How did he supply her? Day by day. So what did the woman live by? Day by day. By faith. But you know what happened to the woman's faith every day? It got stronger and stronger. Why? Because she saw God work every day. Would she have ever seen God work if she had not first believed? So her faith came first, and then what happened? Put your faith into action, and what happens? Faith comes by, it, it builds, it grows. And so God gave her day by day. It's the same thing He did with Israel. He rained down manna every day. And yet Israel never trusted Him. Why not? They never believed in the first place. Y'all see the, the picture there? And so when Christ uses these two examples, He's telling these people, He said, look, I am the Messiah. Would they believe it? 
No. He said, that's right. No prophet is accepted in his own country. By the way, let me remind you of our prophet Elijah. Was Elijah accepted in Israel? <laughs> Folks, the Israelites wanted to kill him. He had to run for his life. But who did accept him? A Gentile woman. Why does Luke use this story? Because Luke's showing us how the ministry was not just for Israel, it's for the whole world. And so he picks this Gentile widow. Now he does another. He uses, uh, go to 2 Kings 5. This, this is a famous story. Y'all probably know this one, but go over there. <clears throat> All right, 2 Kings 5, we got the story of Naaman. Now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man. Y'all see, this is the head of the Syrian army at a time when Syria ruled the world. He was a great man with his master and honorable because of him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Y'all remember leprosy is used in the scripture to, to show sin. He, you know, there's a great picture under the law that it, it, it can kind of throw you when you first read it. It doesn't seem to make sense. Y'all remember all the different tests for leprosy, for the priest to test the leprosy? He, and he'd say, you go into the priest and look at the leprosy, and, and if the leprosy be fading here or going up there, he's unclean. And if the leprosy be here, you know, he's unclean. Or if he's got a scab there, he's unclean. He said, but... If he be covered from head to toe in the leprosy, he's clean. You say, wait a minute. It don't sound right, does it? Think about the picture. Someone might say, well, I know I'm a sinner, but, you know, I got a little scab. Mm -hmm. What does the true person that's going to be saved say? There's no soundness in me. From head to toe, there's no soundness. See, once a person says that, now they're in a position to be healed, aren't they? So here this leper, uh, uh, Naaman, verse 2. The Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, a young girl. And she waited on Naaman's wife. So he's got him up, you know, they would make slaves out of him. And here she is, she's in his house, she works for his wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would my lord, that's Naaman, notice little L, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. She said if he was back home, there's a prophet at home that could heal him. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus saith the maid that's of the land of Israel. The king of Syria said, Go to. Go. And he goes to the king to get permission to go. This is what he's saying. He goes, tells the king, I want to go to Israel. He says, Go. I'll send a letter unto the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. What does Naaman think? He thinks it can be bought. What does a lot of people think about, you know, salvation? You can tithe to it. It can be bought. It can be purchased. Or you can trade for it. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man doth uh, send to me to recover this man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, how he seeketh the quarrel against me. He said, This king's just trying to go to war with me. Here he's sending him down here for me to heal him. I can't heal him, and he's going to say he wouldn't do it, and he's going to start a war with us. It says, and it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, here's another prophet, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses, with his chariots, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Can't y'all picture the pomp and the ceremony? This man comes riding down and all his, you know, it's like the, you know, Patton coming home. Big parade, but here he comes up there. And who's he going to? Some lowly prophet in Israel, a conquered people, and he comes up. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan. He sends his messenger to him. Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. 
Now look, the ministry of Elijah and Elisha are a picture if you study them. Elisha did twice as many miracles, double portion for him. It's a picture of Christ's ministry, human ministry, and then Christ's ministry from the kingdom in heaven it, it, when he pours out his spirit. It, that, that's the tip, the type, but here it is. Go, wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. All right, what has come to him? The word of the Lord through the prophet Elisha. This is what God said to do. Now, what's the man's two choices? To, do it. to believe it or not believe it. At first, guess what? He not only doesn't believe it, he doesn't even stop to consider it because he's offended, right? Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. He thought he was going to be some big, huge ceremony out there cleansing him. It wasn't what he expected, was it? Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went his way. In the he said, I come all this way for the man to tell me to wash in the river. He said, I can wash in the river at home. What a waste of time. But somebody talked some sense to him. His servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? You see what this proves? He believes this man is a prophet. If the prophet had told you to do something hard, if the prophet had said, crawl back to Syria, I bet you he'd have got down on his knees and started crawling. See, that seems logical that we ought to have to do something, right? Amen. What can we do? We can't do anything but admit there's nothing we can do. we got to just accept it by faith. He said, how much rather then when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? He said, Master, you're ready right now. If that man had told you something hard, I know you would have believed him and you'd have done it. But because he told you something easy, you don't believe it. He said, don't you believe this is a prophet? And so it says, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. It's a picture of being born again, isn't it? Notice he had to do it seven times. You know, seven, of course, is the number in the Bible for this perfection, this completion. But if he had just done it once, you know what he would have been liable to think? Boy, this Jordan River is special. What did, what did doing it seven times? He come up out of the Jordan once, and what did he see? Nothing. Nothing. Did he stop? No. Down again, down again. What did that tell him? God did it, not the water in that river. Uh, he returned to the man of God. He and his company came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And we'll, we'll stop the story there because there, there's a lot more to it. But anyway, would he ever have seen the work of God if he had not first acted by faith? What kept the Nazarenes from being saved that day? They would not accept the person of Christ by faith. They were offended at what he said, and faith never took hold. They never operated in faith, and why? Their expectations were not spiritual, and they weren't in dire need. Were they? You think if someone had come in dire need, I don't care what it is Christ had preached, in dire need, what would they have said? They'd have said, you're right, Lord, I'm a dog, but I've you see the difference? And so what Luke is trying to show us back here is although it looked like the people of God rejected God, they weren't really His people spiritually. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not, racially speaking. But what He really came to do was to save His people, and those people are going to be predominantly among the Gentiles. And that's what exactly Luke has presented to us. And Luke is the man, again, that travels with the apostle of the Gentiles. And all through Luke's book, he keeps bringing in these sort of examples for us so we can see this. Okay? Does that make sense? Y'all got any questions about that? No? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the perfection of Your Word. We thank You for the teaching that You give us through it and the instruction. But Lord, above all things, we thank You for the comfort that we can look in the Scripture and see how You take care of Your people. 
Lord, no matter what lie ahead, help us have faith that you'll supply our need, that you'll provide for everything that is truly needed by us, not just our wants, but those things we need. But Lord, help us never let our faith waver because our comfort is affected or prosperity is affected. Let us look always on you in true in truth and comfort. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll get the stuff for the Lord's Supper.